All right, everybody, good morning. Uh, sorry for any technical difficulties. We're still learning how to use all of our technology. Uh, we are uh, excited to have uh, this time together, and we thought we'd use this time on Sunday mornings uh, to do some learning and to hear from some of the experts in our congregation uh, and to get to know people a little bit better. So it's an opportunity to see some familiar faces, but maybe uh, you've seen people in the hallway and not realized exactly what their expertise was. So uh, I want to introduce you to David Bass, if you don't know him already. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on David and then we'll let, we'll let him speak a little bit and then uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask him some questions about uh, his family and his, uh, his Jewish opinions. Uh, so, uh, so first, let me tell you a little bit about David. Uh, he has his PhD in sociology from the University of Akron and Kent State uh, joint program and is the senior vice president uh, for research and education uh, at the Center for Research and Education at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, a senior fellow uh, in uh, the uh, Institute for Lifespan Development and Gerontology at the University of Akron, and an adjunct professor at the Department of Sociology uh, at the University of Akron. Uh, so to start off, David, um, can you tell us uh, Tell us what the Benjamin Rose Institute does and, and who you work with. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity, Josh. We're big Josh Brown fans, so appreciate you reaching out to us. And I'm happy to, to share a little bit about Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging and the work I do. Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging is a Cleveland-based organization. It's actually 110 years old. It was founded in 1908, and it was... Um, based on an endowment left by a Cleveland businessman. And over the years, the organization's evolved to be a service and research nonprofit uh, focused primarily on older adults and their families. And uh, I've been with Benjamin Rose Institute for over 35 years, and I'm in the Center for Research and Education. And uh, we do have a services side to Benjamin Rose. In addition to the research side, the services side, provides a variety of home and community-based services, uh, senior center services, adult day services, and uh, Benjamin Rose Institute is a national leader in the field of aging. And uh, fortunately, um, has this research side to it where I sit. Great. And so, so in our new world, uh, we, we know that there's, uh, we know that, that one of the most vulnerable populations are um, those who already were suffering from, from uh, medical challenges, certainly the elderly. Um, those uh, just, I think yesterday, the governor was talking about uh, how we are gonna reach out to those who have um, mental disabilities and, uh, and challenges that we need to offer that are, they're used to these daily resources and community centers being open um, where they can have social interaction. Uh, and some of them who are in assisted living, uh, having visitors regularly. Uh, can you give us a sense from your, your expertise, what, what is it that we can do now um, that we are in this new world where a lot of those uh, resources are either shut down or there's limited ability for us to be in with people? Well, this is, you know, obviously this is an international emergency and uh, nothing like this in, uh, that we've seen before. So this is a moving target, and there are no real easy answers, and we're learning as we go. Um, it's very important to treat this as a serious problem, and we all have a responsibility to protect other people as best we can. So uh, we know that uh, older people, particularly older people with chronic health problems, Younger people with chronic health problems, adults of all ages who have a chronic health problem, uh, are at risk. And so we have a responsibility to try to avoid their becoming infected, either directly or, or indirectly because of contact they have with other people. As a result, a lot of the supports that are available normally in the community uh, are not available now. And organizations like Benjamin Rose Institute, we've had to close our senior centers. We've had to close our adult day center. We are a home delivered meals provider, so we are doing even more of that. Um, but it's a serious problem. And uh, as I said, no easy answers. 
hopefully a temporary problem. Um, what we can do to help the vulnerable older adults and their family and friend caregivers uh, is again, new territory. And, uh, you know, family members and friends provide the most help to older people with chronic illnesses. It's really a small percent of people who are older who reside in a nursing home or live in an assisted living facility. Um, so family and friend caregivers historically have provided the most care. And now as other services stop offering their programs, more and more is gonna get put on family members and friend caregivers. So when we think about older adults, in need of care, it's important that we also think about what we can do to support those family and friend caregivers. And frankly, most of the information that's become available for family friend caregivers uh, is pretty limited. And a lot of times people don't think of that other person when they think about whether they could provide help in some way. Um, and more urgent now, people who might have used uh, adult day care programs three days, five days a week, where their relative, their spouse, their parent would go for part of a day or a whole day, they don't have that resource anymore. So that, for many caregivers, that's a little bit of respite time. And for the older adult, that's time to, for their respite too, giving them other things to do, that's gone. So it's gonna put a lot of pressure on the family, the older adult and the caregivers to deal with that. So we have to begin thinking what we can do to support both those people. So what, what can we do over the phone? What uh, you and I had talked a little bit about, uh, you know, that we're not totally cut off. We feel cut off because we can't physically uh, drop in and, and visit somebody. But what are the, what do you recommend? What sort of things can we do uh, by phone? Yeah. Well, so I, I have to preface my answer with what I always say anytime I do a talk about older people, which is older people are not all alike. Um, they're as different or more different from each other as younger people are, because as we age, we become more diverse, not less diverse. So anything I say about older people as a group is bound to be wrong. Um, and so that diversity is the first thing that people have to keep in mind. So. I'll say these things about, um, you know, one of the things that is uh, for many older people, not all by any stretch of the imagination, some of the technology advances that are familiar and widely used by younger adults are not as accessible. Um, so Zoom, for example, for remote learning, uh, as Schools, Sunday school, regular schools, kids are going on Zoom doing remote learning. It breaks up the day. It continues their education. There are lots of older adults who've never used Zoom, never had to, never wanted to. Um, not all. There are many older adults who use it regularly. But a lot of technology solutions might not be common in the lives of older adults, not as common as with younger people. So the phone can be a very effective tool that everybody's familiar with. Um, one of the programs that, that uh, I was the lead researcher on that has been developed over the years is being delivered in, in 50 or so communities around the United States is a telephone coaching program for family caregivers. Uh, it's delivered, it can be delivered to anybody in the US from anywhere. Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging has it as a program other organizations deliver this program. It's all by telephone. This program is proven effective, reduce, improves many outcomes for both the older adult who needs assistance and the family and friend caregivers. Just regular phone calls. So don't underestimate the importance of picking up the phone and making a call. If you're gonna call someone and uh, there's the possibility of using FaceTime, I know for a lot of us, we use FaceTime, we have iPhones, we use FaceTime or, or some version of that to talk to grandchildren or uh, kids of one's nieces, nephews. Try using FaceTime a little more often when you're talking to a parent or a spouse who you might not have face-to-face -face contact with. 
just having that visual adds another dimension to it, but it isn't essential. Um, a phone call more often can do a lot of good. I hear from a lot of people that when someone reaches out and makes a call, even if there's no content, no problem, that can in and of itself make them feel like they're connected and uh, not as isolated, that they could be feeling more isolated now with, with all the coronavirus activity. But you know, isolation is probably the number one problem that older people and family caregivers of older people tell me about in, in our research study. Uh, it's the most common thing people complain about, feeling lonely, feeling <clears throat> isolated, feeling that other people don't understand or know what they're doing. And uh, that's regardless of the coronavirus situation. Add everything that's going on with the virus and that is going to be magnified. So very important to reach out in whatever way you can uh, to an older person who is living alone, uh, to an older person who has health conditions which make them more vulnerable, and to the family or friend caregivers who are providing more of the help. They were already providing most of the help. Now there's even less resources for them to, to turn to. So. Uh, Simple uh, support can be very beneficial. You had made a comment uh, when we were talking before about, so sometimes you'll, uh, and you sort of hinted at this, sometimes you'll offer to help and people will reject the help, which is a very human response. You know, people all the time, it happens to me all the time, we'll call someone and we'll say, can you bring some food? And they say, no, no, don't do that. Or they say, can I, um, can I send you something? Or can I help you with something? And, and people, and we tend to reject the offer. We don't want the help. Um, but what's your experience with offering that with, uh, with the um, Yeah, very important point, uh, Josh. Uh, people in general, older people, no different. Uh, in our society, we value independence. People don't like to rely on other people, oftentimes. Don't want to be a burden to other people. So many times offers of help are, um, people don't take you up on it uh, because of that. Most times the, it's a process of accepting help. So in times of crisis, people are more willing to perhaps accept help and offers of help. Being creative in the ways that you offer help. So for example, um, if you're, technology savvy, you're used to using technology and you do, let's say, grocery delivery services, you know, what can you do to maybe facilitate an older person who's not ever used grocery delivery services before or meal delivery services before? Can you help them by making those arrangements and, and doing that kind of assistance? And maybe if you offer that sort of thing right now, people might be more willing to take you up on it. But offering help and accepting help is a process. Offering once and being turned down shouldn't dissuade you from offering again because things are constantly changing and people are rethinking things by the day. So repeatedly offering can make people feel like there's a safety net if they need it and they might not need it or want it, but offering in and of itself we have found in research uh, has a big impact on people's feeling of loneliness, their perception that they're alone. So keep offering and especially offer perhaps in ways that fill a technology gap that many people who aren't using technology in the same way might find beneficial. You know, the, one other thing, so yeah. simple, but amazing how rare <laughs> this is, Asking people what they want. Um, you know, in our research, we talk to people about their preferences, preferences for how they're cared for, preferences in what people do for them and things they don't want people to do for them. Don't be afraid to ask people that. And, and people may just tell you ways that they wouldn't mind getting help, even if they might be resistant to some of the other things. 
Don't assume they see it the way you do. Asking people how they see it, listening to what other people say is key. So how would you ask that? You would, would you say, uh, what is it that you want? Or what, what, if you were on the phone with somebody, what would you say to them? I would say, is there anything that I can do that might be helpful to you, such as, and I might go through a list of things. A lot of times, instrumental things, things that are very task related, not necessarily focused on emotional support, might be more, um, people sometimes are more willing to accept that kind of assistance, want that kind of assistance, than necessarily just somebody to talk to. But other people may just want somebody to talk to and may just want to know that somebody's checking on them. Uh, again, I, I would give some examples. When you ask people if there's anything you can do, it's very helpful if you can give a list of possibilities to get them thinking and talking about it. And, and, I, and as I said, I think a lot of times it's those household related activities that are a good place to start. Um, that's, that's what I would suggest. Try to be very specific and give some examples. And I think it increases the chance that people will take you up on one of them. And sometimes, again, making that offer, people might say no. Try again a few days later or the next day. Don't stop offering. One of the times something may change, things are always changing, even without the virus situation. Every day, the virus situation is changing. So the answer might be different. And just offering can make people feel like there's somebody paying attention, especially if it's somebody living alone or a, a husband, wife living alone where one person needs care. Outreaching by phone can make a, a big difference. So I want to I want to point to uh, the resources that we're going to post in the in the comments once we're uh, finished with this recording. We're going to put the recording on Facebook um, so that everybody can see it. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of resources uh, that you had sent to me. Can you um, share what and that are and, and how open are they? How available are they in this uh, Corona world? Yeah. Well, I'll preface my answer by saying. Um, as all of you know, getting services or getting assistance in, in, in our country is not the easiest thing to do, and you have to be persistent in making phone calls. So anybody who's tried to get a house repair done, anybody who's tried to get something from an organization knows it's usually not one call. And that's something other people can help someone with. So calling on behalf of somebody to one of these organizations that are set up to really provide assistance. So the, the first place I would call, if you have a question or you want information or you're looking for service options for an older person or a family caregiver, first place I would call is the Area Agency on Aging for your area. Most of the people who might be listening, most of the people in our congregation, the uh, Direction Home is the name of the Area Agency on Aging for our area, the Akron-Canton area. Um, and, and as Josh said, there's a, a, a phone number and link that was posted so you can get that information. That's a great starting place. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is another place. It's a great starting place. The way the Alzheimer's Association set up now, if you call their number, you're gonna get a, a number from their central office that would connect you to the local Alzheimer's Association chapter, um, which is the Greater East Ohio Alzheimer's Association. I believe that number's posted too. Um, Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging can be a helpful resource for you. I'm happy to get emails from people with questions. On that uh, posting that Josh mentioned, there's the, the name of our telephone coaching program that I talked about earlier. It goes under the name of We Care. And um, a person in that program would be happy to answer questions or send information uh, if that's all you want. But then there's, a, there's more that you can get from that program, kind of an ongoing coaching. But you don't have to do that. You can just get information. And I'll tell you, when it comes to uh, coronavirus, coronavirus information, 
Um, I think uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, Ohio.gov is a good source for basic information. The governor's done a great job at trying to, to deal with a horrible situation, and there's a lot of good information that you can get online, um, and you could print it and give it to somebody else who doesn't have that capacity. I know a lot of us don't have printers handy working at home. That's a big problem. But, you know, if you, if you have access to a printer and somebody doesn't have that computer technology, printing things, having, and, and these are a lot of simple things, right? These are not complex things. Permission, take care of yourself. Get outside if you can. Try to eat well. Don't watch the news too much if you're overdosing. You know, very kind of simple recommendations, but um, these are important things, even though they're not complicated. So I would try these government sources. Um, and again, uh, if, if you run into barriers, I'm happy to take emails with questions and I'll respond. Thank you. I wanna also uh, share that we've created a Temple Israel a virtual care group on Facebook that uh, we'll post the link to also, which is uh, trying to serve a very specific need, uh, which is if you are able to help people with technology over the phone, maybe help them set up a Facebook account uh, or uh, help them with uh, figuring out how to use, how to watch services online and do other things. Uh, we're trying to get a, a group of people to do that. I want to close with something I've always wanted to do. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is something that's very fun, and I hope it's fun for everybody else, because David, uh, you can see the great work that, that uh, David is doing uh, and has really spent uh, his career uh, researching and becoming an expert in this. Um, but he's not just any expert, he's our expert. Uh, and so um, there's a great show uh, that is, uh, I'm not sure if it's even on anymore, called Inside the Actor's Studio, uh, in which there were always five questions that, uh, that were asked of every guest. Uh, so I've adapted those questions, and David's going to share a little bit about his personal life now um, and his Jewish life uh, so that we can continue to get to know him as our expert. Uh, so first, David, tell us who lives in your home. Uh, under my roof is uh, my wife, Kathy Judge, my son, uh, Jacob, who's seven and is having a Zoom Sunday school meeting right now <laughs> downstairs, uh, three dogs, five cats, fish lots of plants, and uh, although not under the roof very often, I have to give a shout out to my brother, Steve Sweedler, who many of you know. We're, we're brothers by marriage, and if I didn't mention his name, I hear about it for a couple of years, and I don't okay. want that. Good. Uh, what's your favorite Jewish food? So when I was 13, I stopped eating animal products, which eliminated a lot of Jewish foods. So Karosa, I'm the Karosa man. <laughs> that would be that'd be my favorite. Uh, if given a choice to spend a day sitting in Yom Kippur services or a day building a sukkah from scratch, which would you choose? Uh, neither option sounds very good, but I go for the <laughs> Yom Kippur service. <laughs> uh, what what's a problem in the world you wish the Jewish community could solve? Um, you know, we are working on an ongoing issue about around dementia care that is going to come to our community. A lot of the work I do is not in the local area. It tends to be in other communities. But this is a project we're doing right here where we're creating a dementia-inclusive community by involving faith-based organizations, businesses, universities, schools, and um, We'd like to see the issues, we'd like to see dementia destigmatized and brought for open discussion because people living with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or other conditions that cause memory loss, that's what I'm talking about when I say dementia. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement. People are, are hesitant to talk about dementia, people are hesitant to seek help for it, there's a lot of fear. And our goal is to, to bring this out and educate people and help people understand this condition, which affects so many uh, people around the, country, around the world, including in the US. So that's, that's an important project that uh, I hope you'll hear about in the next few years. Uh, and so last question, if God spoke to you directly, what do you think, what, what would you want God to say? 
Uh, I'd want God to give me guidance on how to be a more compassionate person and compassionate to other humans and, and all creatures. Okay, well, I think it seems like, uh, it seems like you've already done a, a pretty good job of that. We know you, you have a lot of life going on in your house. And, and I, I, as I know David personally, he's, um, he's just a great compassionate soul. We're lucky to have you uh, in our congregation. Uh, and we thank you for taking the time to, to teach us this morning. And hopefully um, people will, uh, will learn from what you shared and we can help the people who are, are quite vulnerable now. They've always been vulnerable is the truth. But we, uh, perhaps now this will help all of us realize what it is we can do right here in our community to help people um, who, uh, who are perhaps more isolated than they were uh, a few weeks ago. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and, uh, and for being our teacher this morning. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we really appreciate you and all you do for our community. And thank you for being there and asking for the talk today. Well, uh, for those who are tuning in, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll post the video on Facebook. Uh, and please help us out by sharing it so that it pops up on people's feeds and they can get this great information. Everybody have a good week and uh, we'll see you all soon.